From our downtown Cleveland studios, this is WUAB 43 Forum, a weekly program concerning people and issues that affect Northeast Ohio. Good morning and welcome to WUAB 43 Forum. I'm your host, Harry Boomer. This morning we're going to be talking about getting the lead out. No, I really mean it. We're going to be literally talking about ways to uh, get lead out. It is crucial to get the lead out of our environment, especially the places where our children live and play. Kimelon Merriweather, the project director of the Lead Safe Living Program, or campaign of the Cleveland Department of Public Health, is here. We're also joined by Dr. Thea Wilson, the executive director of the Office of Early Childhood Education from the Cleveland Schools. Now they are here to update us on the most important part of that is, of course, removing lead. Ladies, it is so important to have you here, and thank you for being here. Thank, thank you. you. All right. Let's talk first about uh, who you are, where you come from, what it is you do a little bit, uh, so, so folks will know who they're watching for the next half an hour. Kimelon, if you will. My name is Kimelon Merriweather. I'm the project director, like you said, of the Let's Safe Living Campaign, and I work at the Cleveland Department of Public Health. It is my, my work to manage the, the Greater Cleveland's plan to eliminate childhood lead poisoning. Okay, and doctor? I am the executive director of early childhood pre-K through uh, second grade. Uh, we work with uh, not only the students, but also the teachers in Cleveland schools. All right, thank you for that. Lead has been around for a very long time, and I think one of the problems is because it has been around for a long time, people tend to forget about the dangers that it poses. Uh, especially in an older city like Cleveland where we have older stock housing and back in the day they used a lot of lead paint. I know that uh, probably the last 10 or 15 years they stopped using lead paint. I'm not sure exactly how long ago it was. Maybe we can talk about that. But talk to us about why it's important for kids not to be exposed to lead. Well, when a child is exposed to lead, it can cause lifelong problems. The most detrimental problem, of course, is loss of IQ. It can affect their ability to learn their ability to behave themselves in the classroom. And all these things are really critical when you look at a child successfully moving from childhood to adulthood and being productive in society. So we really want our children to be protected from lead so that they can have the best future possible. And to understand that uh, the lead poisoning actually works against the learning process and the education process. So that's why Cleveland schools uh, feel that it feels that it's critical that we get the word out to parents that this is an, an issue that they really have to be up on. All right. I know back in the day we used to say that lead would cause mental retardation. And I know there is some sensitivity around the word retardation these days, but as you say, it does impede the learning process. We'll talk more about that when we come back. We've got to take a break. Please take time to call someone, let them know that we're talking about living healthier without lead in our systems and environment. By the way, WUAB 43 Forum can be found on the web at 19actionnews.com. Stay with us. We'll be right back. Welcome back. I'm Harry Boomer. And with me this morning are Kimelon Merriweather of the, Safe, uh, the Lead Safe Living Campaign and Dr. Thea Wilson of the Office of Early Childhood Education. Uh, she works for the Cleveland Schools. The ladies, again, thanks very much for being here. You know, we've only briefly touched on the lead poisoning and why it's important. We want to delve a little more deeply into that and talk about why it's important to literally get the lead out and to keep it out. Uh, talk to us about where lead is most often found and how we might abate it, if you will. Well, lead is primarily found in old housing, of course. If your home was built before 1978, you could probably presume that it has lead. 1978 was the year that the federal government banned the use of lead-based paint in residential houses. But specifically, if you look throughout your home, window sills are usually a culprit, porches. We, we see a lot of children becoming exposed to lead from playing on the porch because it's a, what you think is a safe area. However, those are the kind of things we're talking about. Any kind of wood surface, any painted surface that the paint is starting to deteriorate or break down, if you know you have an older home, those are the areas that you want to have some caution. And doctors, we know that kids are very curious. They will put things in their mouths that you wouldn't imagine they would put in their mouths and picking up lead paint and putting it in their mouths or just touching it and putting their fingers in their mouth poses a problem. Unfortunately, uh, lead-based uh, paint uh, has a sweet taste to it, which attracts children. Uh, before the break, you also talked about uh, retardation. We call it developmental delays. But I did want people to understand this does not preclude that good teaching can help children uh, deal with these situations. All right. 
talk more about the, the medical danger of uh, ingestation of, of lead. And both of us can uh, speak to that. Mm -hmm. uh, but one of the things we know with young children, this is the time where their brains are developing. And uh, this is a crucial part of their development. And when uh, any kind of uh, impairment occurs, it could cause uh, in some of the studies also talked about actually brain injury when it comes to um, uh, lead-based paint poisoning. Kimala? Specifically, lead <coughs> really interferes with how the brain operates. And in really high extreme cases, we can see death. It can cause problems with their kidneys. It can cause problems with their growth. So you might see a child who is severely poisoned, their growth actually becomes stunted. So these are all things that can be avoided. And we're here today to really talk about prevention that's the best treatment for lead poisoning, just to avoid all of the problems that are associated with it. It's also been known to cause attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. So. And it can uh, also uh, really range in behaviors as well. Uh, you can have a child who is extremely lethargic to the child who has ADHD, who just cannot uh, pay attention in class and work, and that therefore causes issues in the academic growth. Mm -hmm. And I just want to mention one more thing. There is no cure for lead poisoning. That's the most important thing. There are some treatments, that, the, but the treatment is not a cure. So it's really important for parents to understand that this is something that could affect their child for a lifetime. You know, it's, it's interesting when you think about uh, the long-range long range implications on how easily one might be exposed to lead. Mm -hmm. For example, um, mom and dad live in a different house than grandma. Kid comes to visit grandma who lives in an older house. She's not generally thinking about, or grandpa, not thinking about lead being in the house because it's not normally a risk for him or her, you would think. But when the kids come over, the grandkids come over, and they get into everything, now you're talking about having to be aware of all of, it, of, all of this. What do you suggest people do uh, when it comes to trying to make sure lead is out of the home environment especially? Well, the best thing you can do is use your eyes. Look around, look in different areas, good housekeeping. You know, some things like it, wet mopping, wet wiping out the window wells, things that don't cost a lot of money but go really far in terms of how much benefit that they can yield. Things like looking at if you have a child playing on the floor, how about putting the child on a little blanket or something. Taking your shoes off before you come into the home. A lot of people think that when, you, when someone asks you to take your shoes off, they're being funny, but it's actually a good way to prevent lead from being tracked in. There is still a great amount of lead in our soil from past use of leaded gasoline. So taking your shoes off, using doormats, looking around the home to make sure that you don't see any paint chipping and peeling off, because just like the doc Dr. Wilkin just said, if a child finds an area like that, they'll think it's their little treat because it tastes sweet to them. So finding those areas, fixing them, cleaning them before they become a problem, before we see a child, with, before we see your child with a lead exposure. Mm -hmm. Doctor, talk to me more about uh, some of the, uh, the, the, the negative effects uh, on the brain and the development of children when it comes to uh, having been exposed to lead. Uh, we talked a little bit about it. Uh, in Cleveland schools, we have recognized some behaviors uh, and have implemented what we call a PATHS program. That's because uh, many times uh, what it really affects uh, because of the ADHD is the, it, it impairs their judgment. Uh, children become very uh, impulsive. So therefore, we've put in place a, a, a curriculum that will help children regulate their behavior and learn uh, different behaviors uh, as far as looking at how would I best better make a, a judgment in this. And it starts at pre-K. Break down uh, the letters ADHD. What is that? I mean, we, we hear it, and some of us think we have a pretty good understanding of it, but what actually is it, and how is it identified and how might it be treated? ADHD is Attention Deficit, deficit Hyperactive Disorder. Uh, it can be regulated with medication and one of the things that uh, if it's not uh, a variable with lead paint, a lead poisoning, um, it can be regulated with medication. However, uh, we're not, and you know, there's, there's need of, of a lot of uh, research on this. We're not sure if the medication will counteract the effects that lead would have coupled with the ADHD. Uh, ADHD, talk to me again. Break it down just a little more for me. Attention, attention de deficit, deficit, hyperactivity disorder. Hyper right. 
And now, how do we differ from understanding what that is or a kid that just happens to be very active, for example? Because kids normally like to play and run and jump. Absolutely. Uh, I know uh, and many parents will call me and say, I think this child is hyperactive. I said, can he sit and listen to a book? I said, and they would normally say yes. I said, well, then he is not hyperactive. He's just active. And most children, we want them to be active. We want them to be moving around. Their brains tell them their bodies need to move, and that's the best way to teach children, by giving them things that's going to help them to move, going to touch things, that kind of thing. When it becomes uh, ADHD or attention deficit, children can no longer sit for any period of time. And I'm not talking 45 minutes, I'm talking maybe five minutes. Uh, I ask them if they can sit and watch a, a, a cartoon. If children can't sit long enough to watch, you know, a, a very short cartoon, you might want to look into this. Uh, however, like you said, children are going to be active, and most times, if parents will tell me if they're going to, um, they're hyperactive, I said, let's 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 observe this for a while. And nine times out of ten, they're just active. They're mm -hmm. not hyper. And we do want them to be active. That's how they learn, and that activity oftentimes will lead them to be curious enough to pick up lead paint, things like that. Absolutely. All Absolutely. Right. And curiosity in children is something that we nurture and, and desire. But that takes a parent to temper what they're curious about. All right. Good. We've got to take another break. And when we come back, more about the dangers of lead. Don't go away. WUAB 43 Forum will be right back. and dealing with those students who may have a learning disability as an adjunct to having been exposed to lead. Our pre-K teachers, uh, we have uh, about 53 of them this year, 53 classrooms. We require that all children uh, come to us with a physical form d completed by a doctor. So therefore, the lead uh, test is on there. But Kimmeline can speak a little bit more about that. And it's important for this to happen. Uh, not only for pre-K, but other grades as well. We really want to encourage parents that have children under the age of six to get their kids tested, and that's done by a medical provider, of course. They will either do a finger stick or take the blood out of the arm, but that's really the only way you can know for sure if your child has an elevated blood lead level. And it's another point that I want to make to parents. If the medical provider tells you that their lead, le their lead level was normal or that it was low, that's still a sign that there's been exposure. It is not normal to find lead in the blood. That means that that child has been exposed somewhere to some type of lead surface. And as I'm looking at the literature you brought me, it says that children should be tested at least twice before their third birthday, and again, when they're around six, as you mentioned here. Yes, and because we do have such an issue in our community with lead poisoning, we actually recommend testing every year up to age four. If they've never been tested before they're age four, before they're six actually, one more test before they turn six. Because we do see cases where a child had a no lead level before, maybe they move, and then of course there might have been exposure, and then we see an elevated blood lead level. How much uh, does it take uh, to ingest of lead uh, in terms of a piece or a lot for it to become a problem? Is there any minimum? Well, not really. I mean, you, you see some kids that, are, that eat paint chips. Of course, that would be a more profound exposure. But most of our kids are really poisoned from exposure to household dust. So there really is no definitive amount to say, well, if they eat the, ingest this amount, it'll lead to an elevated blood lead level. What we practice is there's no safe level of lead in the blood. Because uh, the other thing we want people to realize and understand, this does not go away. It will be in the body forever because it actually goes into the bone. Mm -hmm. So it's stored there. Just like we would store uh, iron that's good for us, mm -hmm. lead is also stored in the bone. And it's very bad for us. Absolutely. It's not something that you want to take on a daily basis. No, it's not a vitamin. Um, when a child grows into adolescence and then into adulthood, what kinds of manifestations do we see? Is it the same symptom that we saw as a child, just bigger now, or what? Does it morph into something else? I don't have the uh, studies on that because we're just really finding out how much damage this is really, uh, you know, causing to children. We do know that it remains in the body and we do know that 
uh, hyperactivity remains with children, and you know, and you've heard of adult deficit uh, hyper disorder as well, because it remains with children, and they have to learn how to deal with that rather than just thinking that it's going to go away. So we don't know the full, you know, the full uh, ramifications of all of this, but we know that it's a lifetime um, issue. When we're talking about a child who's been exposed to lead and they are hyperactive. Uh, talk to us about parents and the role they play and the attitude they should have. Because when a kid is running around, jumping on things, breaking things, just mm -hmm. won't sit down, mom, dad are tired, it takes a special attitude and a disposition to deal with that child so you don't do emotional damage or lash out in a physical way to hurt that child for something that he or she has no real, uh, it's not their uh, responsibility. They didn't know that eating this lit paint was going to hurt them. They're not responsible Correct. enough to have dealt with that. So what, what kind of attitudes and roles do parents play here? I think one of the things that uh, uh, Kimalan and I really feel is knowledge. Understanding the child, and she's already said the only way they're going to know for sure that the child has been exposed is by a test. And that will give them, uh, you know, some indication of what they can do. But one of the things I know is being consistent with children, making a procedure for children. And this is, goes for all children, but most especially uh, children with uh, this, this disorder. If you're consistent with them and you're, you're very explicit in their teaching, then uh, you can kind of work with this. The other part of this, parenting, I constantly tell people, if you think parenting is easy, then you're not doing something correctly. <laughs> it is not an easy job. But one of the things you, do, you can do is go seek help. Ask your pediatrician. Go to the teacher. Go to the principal. We have a, a department that will work with you as far as working with your child and really getting to understand where, what you need to do as a parent. And I just want to add that parents can also look at their child's nutrition good nutrition, good hand washing. So a child that's been exposed to lead, you want to feed them things that are high in iron, high in calcium, high in vitamin C, and those are things that help a child grow and thrive anyway. However, they also prevent the lead from becoming absorbed in the body. So these are things that grandma always told us to do mm -hmm. because it was the right thing to do. Wash hands, prevents disease, and prevents lead poisoning. Yeah, when you think about, let's, let's think of our being in an imaginary house that is an old house in Cleveland. Uh, the paint is beginning to peel and uh, children are coming to visit. What should that person in that house do to make sure to mitigate lead exposure? So in that situation, they obviously wouldn't have time to go run out and get a certified contractor. But how about simple things like keep the child from going in those areas. If there's a room that there's a lot of peeling paint, close the door. Prevent that child from going in that room. Put some blankets on the floor if they're going to be playing on the floor. Make sure they're washing their hands. Wash their toys also. Sometimes we see kids getting poisoned from playing with their toys because dust has settled on the toys or hard surfaces and they're walking around and putting their hands into their mouth and putting the lead into their body. Simple, simple things like that can help prevent a child from becoming exposed to lead. And I think also being aware that some toys actually are uh, filled with lead or have some lead in them. We've had recalls toys coming from other parts of the world Absolutely. that have lead uh, levels that are way too toxic and we have to be aware of that as well. Toys and jewelry. Uh, many, uh, many of the uh, cheaper brands of jewelry will have uh, a certain amount of lead in them as well. All right. I want to touch a little bit more on what the district is doing uh, when a child comes to it with uh, uh, some elements of having been exposed to lead what the district does to identify and work with that child. Remember that our pre-K students, and uh, Kimalan has said, that you really need to look at children six and under. So that would be our pre-K and our K uh, levels of children. Our pre-K, come, they come into uh, to the building with the, you know, the actual uh, form that is completed. So we have a, a general idea of how many children are coming in to us with those issues. We have uh, psychologists, we have uh, the teachers understand this, uh, we have the PATHS program that I uh, talked about before that actually work with these children and teach them 
how to regulate their behaviors because that's one of the uh, larger things that we see with these children. If we can get the uh, behavior uh, into a position where we can work with the child, then the academics will grow. Uh, Kimmeline also um, spoke to us about the fact that children at, at, at this age, even kindergarten, um, have issues. Uh, we, at, right now, we ask very vehemently that parents also, even at the kindergarten level, uh, come in with a, uh, a physical form. So we'll know. So the teacher will know. The teacher, is, it's imperative that we know this information. So, uh, and also, Kimmeline, you can speak to the fact that the uh, city, the county, actually has it. Well, before you get to that, we're going to take another break, and then okay. we'll give you a chance. Keep that on the top of your head. We'll be right back, all right? Okay. Okay. Very good. We're going to take another break. We have uh, more to talk about. You know, we welcome your input when it comes to the topics we cover here on WUAB 43 Forum. Here is the list. Alcohol and drugs, crime and violence. We talk about the economy, employment and education. We discuss family and youth issues, plus health care and safety. Housing is always an important topic, so is leadership, race relations, and diversity. If you know someone who can talk clearly about these issues, drop me an email at hboomer at wuab.com with their info for consideration as a guest on the show. Stay with us. We'll be right back. Well, as usual, time is running out, so let's get, take the last few minutes to wrap things up when it comes to talking about getting the lead out. We were going to talk some about the coordination between the county and the city and what the other elements there might be to help deal with this situation. Well, we've been very proud to have our partnership with the Cleveland Metropolitan School District, and we've now partnered with the East Cleveland City Schools. We've trained their teaching staff, we've trained their school nurses, the school psychologists, all about lead poisoning so that they're able to recognize signs and symptoms when they have a student exhibiting behaviors. And we also have a form that can be used with parents who can sign and give consent for us to release the blood lead data to the school district so that we can connect students with resources and help. Well, that's important. So that, uh, that uh, HIPAA doesn't get in the way. So, you know, you can get the information you need. One of the things that I, I was concerned about was whether or not these children who are hyperactive or ostracized and or picked on in school rather than being directly dealt with. And what I'm hearing is that there are things in place, programs and people in edu education in place to make sure that they are not picked on, called stupid and or put into some room so that they vegetate basically. Absolutely not. We, uh, we work with all children. If you differentiate the learning process, you take the child where he's coming to you and you work with them, it does work. We know it does. I have had many children to test out of their individual education plan in the last year. So it does work if you do it in an explicit but uh, strategizing, strategizing manner. <laughs> All right. We have about a minute or so left before we have to wrap everything up. I want to make sure if there's something you want to make sure that, you, that we are left with or something you may even want to reiterate, this is the time to do it. Well, I just want to reiterate why you're getting your kid ready for school for the first time or getting them ready to go back. Get your child tested. May that be a part of the preparation of getting them back to school. And that is crucial, I think, in terms of making sure they are ready and that they can get the most out of the education process. Doctor, anything medical that we should be aware of? And not so much medical, but it just uh, holistically. We need to have that information. The parent needs to have that information. So please, please, I'll say again, they have to, they must get the child tested. That's the only way we will actually know. And it's going to help everybody, the child, the parent, the school system, uh, the whole of society, really, when you think about the implications of what the lead poisoning can do to somebody and we want to make sure that is kept to an absolute minimum. Ladies, thank you so very much. Thank you. Thank you. Well, don't forget to check out this and past programs on our website at 19actionnews.com. Click on my picture to see previous shows as well. Thank you to our guest, Kimelon Merriweather of the Lead Safe Living Campaign and Dr. Thea Wilson of the Office of Early Childhood Education of the CMSD. Ladies, thank you for being here and thank you, of course. And crew and members, thank you. Thank you for watching. See you next week. Be well. Take care. <laughs>